Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and with me in the Rabbit Hole studio today, he is the director of the uh, Netflix feature See You Yesterday, Mr. Stefan Bristol. Welcome, Ooh. Stefan. How you doing, sir? Thank hey, you for having me. Man. Thanks for coming, man. You've been on the junket. <laughs> you, you, you've been uh you have been uh, all over i saw you you indie wire and a few other uh, different uh, places that have had you on and i appreciate you coming down here and, and spending a half an hour with me because uh god knows you're probably exhausted talking about this movie um, <laughs> but this will this i guarantee will be the best interview that you've had okay um, let's go <laughs> <laughs> all right so um I uh, want to talk about the, the film and how everything came about, but first I want to talk about you. We interviewed mm. you briefly we, at uh, Bushwick Film Festival. It was the first time we met you. Oh, wow. uh, you talked to Ilaria Malvitsi on, on the red carpet of Bushwick. Um, yeah. But now we got yeah. a lot more time. We got more than like a minute. <laughs> so uh, t- tell me about you. Like, how did you come, how did you get into filmmaking and, and what is your origin story, so to speak? I've always been into filmmaking, man, when I was a, when I was a kid, you know, growing up. Coney Island before I move out to Long Island uh, just watching you know TV shows my favorite movie like Jurassic Park and them but when I was 18 and I wanted to do something for my life I saw do the right thing for the first time and I told my mom I want to be a filmmaker because that movie was just like everything to me and she was not having it um, <laughs> she, you know, she's a Caribbean woman and I love her and she's my biggest fan now yeah I imagine um, she is right and and she wasn't having it, so I just had to try to figure out what else I want to do in my life. But when I went to Morehouse College, I woke up one day, and I said, I'm going to pursue what I really wanted, and that's filmmaking. What was it about Do the Right Thing that kind of, you know, because, I mean, there's a lot of movies that could, you know, people, Star Wars. Yeah. And, oh, but what was it specifically about that film that kind of, like, lit your pilot light, so to speak? It was mostly about... Brooklyn and what what it meant for me as a kid and like everything I saw do the right thing was just me as a kid you saw your life up there yeah I saw my life up there like yeah. this is why I grew up in, in Brooklyn and it was this is crazy and I, I love do the right thing it was not necessarily my life I didn't you know right uh, but it's it's a great great movie and no, you classic. know Every, from from first frame to last it was just like uh, we could actually you. probably do a whole show on do the right thing <laughs> um, and you work so um this movie, See You Yesterday, yeah. great title, by the way. Uh, love oh, the title. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so you, you worked, um, Spike Lee was a producer on this, speaking of, of Do the Right Thing. Yeah. Um, so how did this come about? Like, first of all, uh, tell us about the movie. Like, for those of you have, who haven't oh. seen it yet, um, or, you know, like, give me the, the Hollywood, like, log line oh, for the picture. Oh, easy. It's about uh, two scientific uh, teenage prodigies from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, who build time machines to go back in time and to save one of their brothers from being wrongfully killed by a police officer. So we're going to get into challenges because mm. the the movie itself, I've seen the movie, I really liked it, um, and I love the kids in it. Uh, yeah. tell, who are the stars of it? Tell, tell me the... the Eden uh, Duncan Smith and Dante Critchlow. Uh, the great, Not Eden, Eden. Eden. <laughs> uh, great kids. The, um, you, I, I think, uh, cast perfectly. Um, Thank you. Man. And I also think it, it, one of the things I really liked about it is something you don't see in films. Yeah. Uh, you don't you don't often see young people of color who are into science unless yeah. it's like a superhero movie or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like this, I just thought it was great. So uh, that's what the movie is about. But like, how did it how did it come? Like, how is it? What inspired it? And like, right. how did um, how did you kind of get it from the page to screen, so to speak? I was a thesis student um, at NYU Graduate Film School, and I wanted to go back to my roots of why I became a filmmaker, and that was that's the action adventure genre. And I just wanted to do something with black people in that genre. And I was working on a time travel movie about you know a kid trying to save his best friend through a drunk driving accident. And I, while I was writing that, uh, it was during the summer of 2014 where Eric Garner and, and Mike Brown got murdered, and that bled to my script. Uh, and a professor saw that in the script, and she was like, listen, uh, that part in the script is one small part of, about police brutality. It's either you leave it in or take it out. And I decided to leave it in because I knew, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, you know, wrongful cop killings is going to continue. Yeah, that was five years ago, and the movie's uh, sadly topical today. Um, unfortunately. Yeah, so... Unfortunately. Um, and to me, it presents some interesting challenges, right? Because you've got 
a time travel movie, which tonally is pretty fun. Mm-hmm. Like these kids, you know, they're great kids, and it's a pretty upbeat movie. Right. It's also, um, I like the color palette of it a lot because Thank it's you. bright and it's like summer in the city, yeah. and it's so freaking Brooklyn. Like <laughs> it's just like because I, you know, I live here, and I'm like, man, this this movie is the most Brooklyn movie I've seen in a long time. <laughs> uh, and the kids seem like you know they're real, like they seem like real kids. Yeah, I mean they're super geniuses who you know make time machine backpacks, you know, yeah. and and you know there's a science fiction element to it, but they seem like real kids. And yeah. so like, how do you? Um, First of all, so from the script stage, you know, you're going to do this thing where you have time travel, which is challenging. Yeah. And then you're going to deal with this difficult subject matter. Yes. So, like, how do you combine the two of those things and have a cohesive movie? Because I think a Mm -hmm. lot of people would probably give you notes on tone and be like, hey, man, you can't have Back to the Future mixed Mm -hmm. with, you know, cop killing. Like, it's, um, you know, and the, you know, the murder look like it's it feels mm-hmm. like it's polar opposite but somehow in right. the movie it blends how were right. you able to kind of attack that on a story level easily oh say okay it's not easy <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of trial and error that's all it is it's like you work with you work with the first draft and you go from there and and i guess because i have a lot of training and directing actors and know how to write a screenplay i was i was able to know how to craft a scene and and know how to use humor um, humor is not is not comedy, but humor is there to keep the lightheartedness going during a tragedy. Um, and because it's, that's it's like life too. It is life. Yeah, like it's real, real life. And people it, laugh at funerals. You know, people people do. That's there's, true. there's there's you know there's a yeah. mixture of that even in the darkest times. People still make jokes and still people. Yeah. You know, it's it's not uncommon. You don't see it a lot in movies. No. But the reason I think you don't see it in a lot of movies is some executive giving you story notes and saying you can't have a funeral and and humor and time travel. Well, here's, you know? here's the thing. When I first started out making this film, I, I did not imagine it would go to Netflix. Really? No. This this was not a Netflix movie. It was more. It was not even a studio movie. It was a totally independent film that I was gonna do. I did it. I did the short film independently. Um, and, you know, it was it was I was struggling to get the money. My mother, she helped uh, with some cash. She refinanced her home. Oh my God! To give me some cash for the for the for the short. Uh, Spike gave me a production grant through NYU, and and what and and I was not, when Spike picked up the. Um, the feature first and they say, hey, Stephanie, want, want me to be a producer? I said, sure, no problem. I was expecting to, like, uh, use his name to just, you know, get uh, financing from investors. But he decided to say, Stephanie, this is a studio movie. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, hey, if you can go to people and do that, sure. I was like, It wasn't ever a question like, why do you miss these genres? This is so weird tone. I was like, nah, if, if black people we're going to be in sci-fi we're going we're going to talk about our pain and you know the, the other thing too is like in a in a friend of mine um well, in my opinion excuse me yeah hey this is all your opinion don't worry about it <laughs> um, uh, that that comes with the territory but w- what i think is unique as well is uh you see it in the film and you don't see this in a lot of films uh, a friend of mine pointed this out about the movie black panther mm-hmm. he was saying it was something Great movie. he was saying that like in that film you see black people being the answer to their own problems which you don't often see in film. You always see like an outsider coming in yeah. to to you know kind of save them or you know and it's it, you know it, that had a time in its place. But I think now we're getting into the more heroic stories, yeah. and you know this is like the thing I liked about this movie, and I would watch your movie over a Black Panther because nobody arrives in a super suit to save these people. You know what I mean, mm-hmm. like. Uh, this the particularly the main character the girl she's saving herself and she's trying to save her brother yeah. and you know yeah. y- and you don't see that that often which is great wow. talk to me about because you know story wise uh, but ta- you know story wise are, are challenges like time time travel which creates its own paradox <laughs> and then you know you're trying to make like a Back to Future or Terminator and there's Man. always those types of problems right, right. but talk to me about the actual like getting this movie off the ground I talked a little bit about the financing but. Sure. You know, for instance, like the production schedule. How many days did you have to film this thing? A production schedule easily is twenty five days. Okay. And for a filmmaker just coming from from school, that was that's a blessing. You know, people say that that's that's short or limited. And I was like, 
man, I was expecting two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see was, that a lot of times, too. right? And but I was, um, but I had I had a training, I had a, a feature film training before this. I was I was Spike's, I was one of Spike's um, assistants on Black Klansman. Very cool. So I was able to see how uh, pre-production work and how uh, how production work. I didn't see how post-production. Post production work because I was um, busy trying to make this movie. Sure. Um, so it was like four days, not four days, sorry, four weeks of soft prep. That means you're hiring crew, you're hiring the, the, the department heads like production designer, sound, um, the sound uh, mixer. Um, or you're below the, the line people. Yeah. 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 All, all the departments of the costume designer. Um, you, you, you're interviewing people, you're hiring them. And then it's the hard, hard six week out. Um, you have six weeks of prep, and every day is like you got to be on it. You know, I have people come on the show, and they're like, "We did a feature in twelve days. We did a feature in mm-hmm. fifteen days. You know, twenty five days for Impressive. a Hollywood, you know, a Hollywood film is like, oh my god, that's really short. But for for us indie folk, that's like it's a, like that's what a, I got an extra, luxury. I got, yeah. an extra <laughs> I got an extra ten days to make yeah, this movie. Yeah, yeah. No problem, man. No problem. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I, I say this be- because, like, the reason why we have, you know, in Hollywood to have that is because of union rules. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And for independent films, there's no union. Um, right. So you can – and it's low budget. So the, it's, it, it depends on the script and what the script calls for. If it's just, you know, just it's about just two people talking in a room, you don't need 25 days to shoot that. Right. You know, but for my, for my film, it's an action film that deals with time travel and whatnot. Um, I, I need that 25 days. Yeah, you worked with all the fun stuff. So you got kids <laughs> in the movie, you got young people, uh, you've got special effects that you're dealing with, um, and then, you know, you've got a subject matter that's touchy. Yeah. I was I was saying to you before we rolled, I was like, did you want to just, like, get all of the, the challenges out in one go? Like, first movie, that's it, man. I'm just going to take on the mountain of challenges <laughs> and do it all at once. I um, was... I'm conf- I was confident to pull it off because uh, I, you know, I have the training. Um, I've seen how Spike did it on on for Black Klansman. Um, I mean, if you're gonna watch somebody, he's a pretty pretty good, you know, and he teaches as well. So he te- yeah, he teaches at NYU. He's a tenure. He's a tenure now, and I was like, when I was watching, he's smooth like butter. You can't even, you know, he doesn't break a sweat. Yeah, you know what I'm saying, and, he, and every every day he knows exactly where to put the camera. He knows exactly how to talk to the actors, or how to deal with them. Well, he's been doing this for like thirty something years, so that's yes, you know duh. you you know you're, yes. you're you know you can't expect to be Spike Lee your first day. <laughs> <laughs> Just you know. I tried too, silly me, silly me. I, I, I'm an <laughs> idiot for trying to be like Spike, and I well, learned I, quickly. Okay, <laughs> I learned quickly. I was like, I gotta find my own rhythm. <laughs> exactly. You know, and that's it's good to have that. I think it's good to have that sort of like, well, for instance, he was on the picture with you right now. He's he's listed as a producer, yeah. but I don't know if he was more of an exec producer or if he's there day to day. How involved was he with the picture and how much were was he how much was he able to like sort of mentor you while you're making the movie? Or was it just like, hey, kid, you got it. Go, <laughs> go make your movie it's kind of thing. It's a mix. I'll be honest with you. He was. He read every draft, um, and he there. And he was there to to uh, have me meet with the executives, and 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 he was there to make sure that we're working on the script. Uh, but he let me do what I feel that is best for the movie. He was like, "Hey, this is your movie. Do your thing." And and he was shooting. She's got to have a season two at that time. She was never on set. I see. He was set on for one day. That was the first day. Um, but other than that, even when he wraps, she's got to have it. He would still not come to set. He just allowed me to do what I want to do. I mean, I think that's great because, um, especially as a young filmmaker, it's great to have. He trusted uh, me. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's great to have that trust and empowerment. But it's also great to have somebody who's like kind of got your back when it comes to the executives, and sort of you know helping you along creatively without you know kind of letting the system stifle you or you know letting the yeah. business of filmmaking getting in the way of filmmaking like it often yeah. does in Hollywood. Um, I still had to deal with that. Yeah, tell me, like, if you, like lessons. I, I would imagine because you mm. you'd made shorts before this, but this is your yeah. first feature. Yeah. Um, and going through the whole process. I mean, so first, like, just getting the movie made, and then um, going to, you know, the process with Netflix and getting it released. 
what were the kind of things that you learned along the way? Because this is your first time through this process, right? Yeah. So I imagine it's a huge yeah. learning experience for you. It, uh, it's fast too. Um, yeah, you got you got to like hit the ground running. <laughs> you know, like I said, like I didn't imagine I didn't imagine that I was gonna be a, just a studio film. I was like, okay, we're gonna make a Ricky Dinky film, just to show who I am, and hopefully a lot of people see it. And then I'll figure out my next move uh, because I have something very strong to say, I have something specific to say, and I just needed to get this movie out. Sometimes I think um, it, it's a matter it's a matter of timing, yeah. you know, and you had, because sci-fi is really big right now, and, <laughs> and, and the subject matter is very topical. So yeah. you were able to kind of hit two buttons of, you know, both genre and um, social significance at the same time. Yeah. Which not a lot of movies can do. It's this is really sort of a magic bullet of a movie in that way. I was just, I was just when there's a will, there's a way. I just it, I know that this was the film for me, and I had a mission, and and I, I believed in myself. I had faith. Mm. I'm a faith based. I'm a faith based person, and and I just wanted to do what I want to do. I feel like I've said this. I've probably said this on the show before, but like being a filmmaker is almost like uh, being a clergyman or something. Like. <laughs> You, you have to have this like unshakable belief in yourself and your abilities, and like, am I, am I, is this, is what I'm believing in real? Mm. You know, um, and most people don't know until it, it happens to them. And speaking uh, on that, one, this I made a lot of sacrifices to get this film off the ground. I have cried. I have, you know, the, you know, there were sometimes I, I had to get off Twitter. Because, like, you know, I was cussing people out when I was supposed to not be cursing people out on Twitter. Uh, because I, I took it, I take it personally because they don't understand the amount of stress and fatigue and, 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 and helplessness sometimes just to get this movie off the ground. Um, have I got it a lot easier than, than a lot of filmmakers? Sure. And I'm not going to deny that. Um, but I still had to, had to make sacrifices. Like, you know, I, I couldn't get a full time proper job. Um, I had to ask my mom for, to pay, help me pay rent. Um, 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 there's a lot of things I had to give up for just to get, make this movie that I can't name. Uh, not to say it's terrible, but it it does challenge. Um, it, it, there was, it does challenge me, and 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 now nah, I'm I'm glad it made me grow. But you know, if 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 me and you are like alone right now, bro, I will break down and cry. I you know it's like, I think I'm that not, I'm that's not even lying to you. It's like not a lot of people talk about that, and I'm it's glad that you said something. I actually. I have this conversation kind of with myself daily about mm. doing this and you know like every I once love it. every once oh my god I, I had somebody say to me I was talking chop with a, a producer friend of mine and randomly there was like a DP overheard us in a bar and he's like you guys are absolutely right <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and he told me he's like man he's like my uncle who is also in the business he's like you know he's like this this job it's like you're either going to do this or you're going to die trying yeah. because um it you have to do it to the point of like nothing else in your life is going to make you happy and you know it, it comes down to that yeah. and like you know and even someone like you i mean you got what a lot of people would assume is a lucky break yes. you know yes. uh which is great you know and but i was prepared for it though like i, I worked my ass off to be prepared for it like, exactly you know, and, and that's not good you, know? you, you really do make your own luck in this business because mm -hmm. if you if you hadn't made the short if you uh didn't you know speak to the right people if you yeah. you know if you weren't talented you know because you know spike lee teaches at nyu he's got a lot of students you know what I mean? Like yeah. he's he, a lot of people, and, and God knows he knows enough people. But there yeah. must have been something special about you and what you wanted to say that made him say, "I want to produce that movie." You know, yeah. that's you don't see that every day. You know, no, you don't. I mean, he hasn't knocked on my door yet. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I want to get him on the show. If you talk to him, I, he, he, he's a he's definitely um, he's the guy that he's my gold guest that I want to get on the show because there's no more, there is no one more indie film than Spike Lee in my opinion. You that's, know, that's he's real. the most indie dude out there, and he's still rocking it. You know, but uh, I, I think uh, the movie for for the most part, it's a real achievement. Um, Thank you. You know, you talked about the sacrifice, but what were the things that, um, is there anything that you learned that you would, you know, somebody said, hey, man, Stefan, you made that great movie. I'm going to make my first feature. Mm -hmm. what, what advice would you give me? What what, uh, what would you tell somebody who's trying to make their, their first feature other than, you know, uh, you know you're know, going to have to practically kill yourself in order to make it? <laughs> uh, no, no, what would you tell no. somebody? Take your time. Don't rush. 
Take don't it. rush into production. In other don't words. rush. Don't don't rush on the script. Don't rush on you know trying to get. get. Well, depend on depend on the script. I had to rush to get into production of mine uh, for various reasons. But when it comes to making the script, just writing, don't rush on that. I think probably uh, the number one thing that I've seen in people's work that was like, it's just undercooked scripts. Scripts that mm-hmm. they hadn't stayed long enough in the oven. They brought them out too fast. They wanted to rush to production. Yeah. And you, you know, I've I said to people, you can't out direct bad writing. <laughs> you can't out act <laughs> bad writing. No, you you can't. can't outrun bad writing. Man. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where you, you can't polish doodle. Yeah, it's you know, and people try to do it all the time, and they don't yeah. usually realize until they're really far down the stretch, you know, until they're like in mid production, like, oh my God, you know, and then, you know, you have to, you're trying to save the thing in rewrites while you're going and it's just a nightmare to try to get the film on. But that's a great thing. I, I think the fact that you had a, well, cause you had already, you, you'd been building on this foundation for a while. You know, you, you've been working it for a while and, and working on the idea and getting feedback. And feedback, that's another important thing that a lot of people a don't get. A lot of feedback. Yeah, I mean, like, and you're working feedback. with somebody like Spike Lee who's, you know, because this script. And not, and not just, not I didn't get feedback just from him. I had to, like, you know, beg and ask professors to look at it and, 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 and I had to do a table reads. Sure. With the actors. But that's, the f- a, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good trick for filmmakers. What's that? Get a, do a table read? Do a, t- do a private table read. Don't, don't invite friends. Don't invite, like, don't have an audience. Invite actors that are kind of like the type of those characters, but you, you know you're not going to cast them. Right. <laughs> because, if you, if, you know, because if you, if you invite actors to that are exactly like that type, they expect you to cast them in a the movie and you don't want that. Um, because the, the purpose of the table read is to hear it because you need to hear it. Like, once you get the script into a really good draft... See if the music is there, in other exactly. words. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've done that really often really myself, good. and it, it, it's really helpful, yeah. um, especially if you're doing anything with comedy in it um, Ooh, because you got to yeah. hear... Comedy is like music, man. You, get, you really got to hear it. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, jokes are going to fall flat, and, you know, uh, and you, you know, you, you also get the reaction of the actors. Yeah. You know, you get, you know, yeah. are they, um, are they, are they getting it? Are they getting the, are they getting the vibe of it? Are they getting the to- tone of it? Um, yeah. And you can either take their feedback or not. You know, yeah. you can just be like, thanks very much. And then, <laughs> but you know, you, you know, you can sit there and make notes. It's a, that's a great tip is to do a table read. Um, anyway, I'm going to get uh, wrap up. Um, but uh, so you're, you're just finishing up this thing right now and it's, it's currently on Netflix um, do you see your yourself moving into the next project at this point? Or are you like, do you want to get right going on the, the next thing? I have to get on the next thing. I keep the momentum. Up. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's another good lesson: is when you, your sophomore effort, if you're too busy making it, yeah. people won't criticize it. Robert Rodriguez <laughs> said that he's like, he's like, if you don't want the sophomore jinx or you wor- you don't want to wor- worry about people always cr- criticizing your sophomore effort, yeah. he's like, start making it before the buzz dies on your first one, oh, and then wow. get that one out there, and then while that's going, make the next one, yeah. because um, you know you won't give them time, you know, mm. uh, and uh, and this way you'll have that. Um, You'll, you, like you said, momentum. Like it, it, yeah. it matters. And when you lose momentum, it's so hard to get back. It's so yeah, hard to keep. Yeah, yeah. You know, somebody described independent filmmaking as uh, pushing a boulder up a hill. You know, oh, wow, yeah. you know, like and, and it rolls over you. Then you go back to the bottom of the hill and you push it back up again. Oh, uh, it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's weird because I want. I, it's weird because like, um, I'm, I'm pushing myself to get something new started now, but at the same time, it's like I need a break. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes you you just got to refill the well too, you know, like exactly. you got, you know, you got to re-energize and stuff. You should probably like, you know, go away for a long weekend or something at least, you know. I'm trying to, you know? but you know, you know, I, I have to do this, I have to go there. Uh, well, which is quite it's like it's not it's not not you know, it's this no, this but is this like is part finally. of the work too, man. Exactly. This yeah, is like yeah. it's not just enough to make the movie, but to get butts and seats to see the movie or to get the attention for yeah. the movie. Yeah. And that's another thing people people think your your directing job stops as soon as the movie's yeah. edited. It's you know nah. no, then the second half begins. You know? <laughs> it's like you don't you don't stop a football game at halftime. <laughs> you, know, like, you gotta like you, you gotta that push it through. Real talk. Third yeah. quarter, fourth quarter, get it to the end zone, man. Yeah, that's um, real talk. And but. Thanks so much for coming, man. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be for here. people who are uh, interested and people who want to find out um, more about you, uh, where can they find you on the web? On Instagram at, at stuffonbristol.com. That's an S-T-E-F-O-N, bristol.com, not a P-H. 
Gotcha. Um, <laughs> so uh, everybody remember that and follow this cat. He's doing amazing things, and the movie's doing really well. Uh, and then, uh, you know, next project, come on down. We'll talk about it, man. I'd love to have you. That's solid. All right. Thanks for coming. <laughs> thank and you. Uh, thank you all for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more episodes of this show, you can always find them on our website, norestfortheweekendpodcast.com. You can also find us on all the podcast channels, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Once again, I'd like to thank my guest, Stefan Bristol. Thanks for coming, schlepping, uh, coming back home to Brooklyn. And uh, for Behind the Rod Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.